The appointment date is February 4th. And just to tie a little bit with your severe weather things, up until a few years ago, in all the years, the Derby had only ever been postponed three times due to weather conditions. The first time was in the late 70s when there was 41 inches of snow in camp. The second time was the 96 flood. And the third time was when we had those ice storms in January a few years ago and the trees were crashing down. Right? Since then, we have had to postpone it twice due to an inch of snow. So 41, one, what's, I mean. Yeah. So anyway, um, pre-registration, um, Angie is now requiring that all units pre-register for the Derby. They're, I don't know if she's going to do anything at the Derby itself unless there's some last minute <coughs> walk-ins, but uh, she's not requiring all units to pre-register. There is in the book, uh, you should all have this, it's also available on the council website. Uh, it's the information book, the info book. It has the link in it. Uh, it's scoutingevent.com and then there's a council number and then an event number. I have not seen this site yet. I haven't clicked on it. It's up already. If you just go to the yeah. site we all use where it shows all the events, it's actually there as of today. Okay. Okay. Which leads um, me to a question once you get into it and explain it to you. Okay. So that, that, this is new to me. I only just got this piece of information two days ago. Uh, so I haven't had a chance to visit it yet. Uh, there is a, the paper forms yet, I guess, if you want to still go through the council office, but I think Angie would prefer you go online and do it now. I think it would make it much easier for her. Uh, registration fees this year up through Friday, January 20th. The, it's $15 per participant. Uh, the last two days for the Derby, it's $17, and then the day before and Derby Day, it would be $20. So if you want to save some money on it, get, get your uh, registrations in a little ahead of time. Uh, of course, fees are due by 5 p.m. on the cutoff day. It's so on the council office close. Um, and you need to have the rosters and stuff like that. And, and uh, I guess the books you printed here didn't have those pages on, but they are available on the council website where this this is at. There's, there's rosters and a registration form. Everything's there for them to fill out. Okay. The only thing that confused me, and I'm sure you'll explain this once you get into it, is that when she put it up, we're all used to seeing Iditarod or Malamute or Cubs or Troops. Yeah. When she put it up, it's called Dre and Conestoga. Yeah, I'll and explain those in a moment. Yeah. I'm sure you're gonna go over that, but yeah. I just want everybody to be aware when they go in, pay very good attention to which one you want to be registering under. It's a new terminology for us this year and it could be confusing. Okay. All right, um, this I had to leave in. I Really right now, there's not much, COVID, whatever the COVID policy is on that day is what it'll be. So anyway, uh, the theme this year, and that's uh, the artwork of the patch. Uh, we have, they're just being now being sent in to start getting the artwork from the patch company, but that's roughly what it'll look like. It's traveling down the Great Wagon Road. And I chose this theme this year. I always try to look for an interesting theme that has a thousand stories to it. The Great Wagon Road was a colonial era road which ran from Philadelphia all the way down to Georgia. It went down through the Great Valley. And of course, the Great Valley, depending on where you're at, has different names. When you get into Virginia, for instance, it's part of the Shenandoah Valley. So the Great Valley's southern mouth is actually in southeastern Pennsylvania and goes the whole way down the Appalachians, clear down into Alabama. It actually does have a spur that goes northward a little bit into New York, but most people, when they think of the Great Valley, think basically from like uh, York, Carlisle area, that area, you know, between South Mountain and and uh, the next mountain over all the way down roughly where interstate 81 goes down into virginia that's the great valley okay and so this is uh, the story of the great wagon road uh, at the time of the american revolution it was said to be the most heavily traveled and used road in america so it's got a lot of stories to it. <clears throat> okay we're going to be doing some new stations which i'll talk about in a moment a few other details first uh, just remember, start time is at 8.30. We do our best to get everybody out on the trail as quickly as possible. As soon as we get the teams lined up, they're sent out. Uh, we're gonna, there might be a little bit of change to that. Um, still working on it. This was a suggestion from the rain stations. It seems that everybody, when they leave, all seems to head to the same point. 
and they're kind of pushing me into having teams go to a specific station first. We did that years ago, and it was a nightmare. And so I don't know how we're going to work that out this time. But uh, what about how they used to do it? The troops just maybe share that within each unit. I know when my boys were in, once they got started, they just take off down by the training post, stop, get their map out, and then figure out their plan for how they were going to Yeah, that's how we were doing it. We used to one time, we tried it where they were assigned a station to go start and then go from there. The teams just went wherever they wanted to anyway. They yeah, ignored that. And, and that. and and a couple of people running the range stations kind of want me to do that. And I, I don't, and I kind of explained to them, it doesn't work. Yeah. So we might still play something with that. Uh, end time is 3.30. Uh, the rule is if the team is at the station already doing the problem, they're allowed to finish it. They're just not allowed to start it after 3.30. That's how we do that. Okay. Our check-in and check-out will be at the dining hall with free registration and she says it's going to be quicker. <laughs> so hopefully it is. Uh, teams, of course, between three and 12. Uh, really, if you have more than 12 on your team, you should be dividing it into two teams. We recommend six to eight is a good number on average. Um, and of course, uh, now we have all girl and mixed teams will compete within the divisions that they are based on their age level and program level. So you don't have separate from that. All right, this year, uh, so well, starting last year, I started to rename the divisions a little bit. For years, I called the scout level the Iditarod division, and the Weeblows was the Malamute division. Last year, I decided to change it up because I was talking a little bit more about the Alaskan Gold Rush story, which is basically where the Derby's idea broadly came from in another council. They based it off the Alaskan Gold Rush. So I renamed it the Sourdough which was what they called the prospectors that were already there. The ones, the ones that came in to, during the gold rush were the Stampeders. But anyway, this year, because it's the Great Dragon Road, I decided to rename them again. So now the scout level, any scout level program from 11 years and up is now in the Conestoga division. Including venture. Venture, um, any other, is it learning life still around? No. Okay, but any, I would say, because they change all the time, and I'm not up on this, any program that's for a scout level, um, for like 11 years and 11 to 18 years, any program within that age group would be in the Conestoga division. Okay, and we most teams may not enroll in that division. Okay, next slide. Gray division is the Weeblows. These are nine and 10 year olds. And if you don't know, most people are familiar with the Conestoga is it was a specific type of a wagon. A dray is another type of wagon. It's a smaller freight wagon, so that's where that name comes from. It's not as well known as the Conestoga name, but that's why it shows wagon names for these issues. So there are Weeblows. Um, we, uh, for Weeblows, uh, the members must be registered. If they've already crossed over into scouting, they may not go with the Weeblows team. That's an issue that came up a few years ago where I guess there was one Weeblos team that had several that had just recently crossed over. So I talked to the council office about it. That's what we decided. If they've already crossed over, they must be in the, go with the scout team and not a Weeblos team. Uh, they they have, must have two adults, two leadership, and optionally one den chief. Now I do know too, and this is again in there for those that don't know, often parents like to travel along with them. That is fine, but they may not participate with the team. They can only observe. And this is so we don't have one Weeblos team with the two leaders and the den chief and another one with 10 adults helping. Okay, it keeps a level playing field. There is specifically now mentioned one exception. It's always been there, and I'll talk about it in a moment. This exception has always been there, but it's never been specified out, but I was suggested to now specify it out, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, what this is, is scouts that may need what generically is termed a therapeutic support person. This is someone that a, that a scout may need to help them with basic life skills or something like that. Um, it could be a family member, it could be a therapist or whatever. Uh, my sister had uh, used to do this as, you know, kind of thing uh, as a profession, so I asked her what kind of terminology and stuff to use, and that's what she suggested. Um, they are 
they've always been allowed under the ADA law to accompany, but we've never really said much about it. But it did come up last year, and so I, had, I said I would specifically say how it's handled within the Derby. Now for that, uh, for the weed lows, if the scout, one or more, has those, they are not limited under that two leadership and also the gaggle of parents rule because they're there for a specific reason. And we only ask that they, they, they can work with it, with what they need to do, but not do the problem for them, is what they're saying. Let, let the scout do as much of the problem as they're able to. Okay, that's, that's the only thing we ask. But they, they are, like I said, it's now specified. Okay, any specific questions on that? So I'm not sure exactly if anybody has that or not, but, uh, but that's now specified in it. Okay. Uh, awards, scoring is basically the same top five places in each division. Uh, those are the theme, uh, the theme categories for it. And I always have to tell, most likely to collapse is a tongue-in-cheek award. I've had a lot of people in the recent years chew me out over that. You know, supposedly awarding failure. That's not what it is. It's just, you know, that's always been there as what we call a tongue-in-cheek award. And I don't know, there's been a few teams over the years that never made it to the starting line because they built their sleds out of PVC pipe. And of course, out there, it shatters like glass. And, always glue it back together. Yeah. And, and the teams, their usually comment was, well, at least we won something for coming. Yeah. And sometimes those ones that don't look like they're going to make it across the yeah. finish line finish very well. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. So, so I just kind of put that little asterisk there that it's meant as a tongue in cheek award. Okay. Registration and rules. Any questions over anything I've handled thus far before I get into the actual program? Okay. Okay. These are a couple changes for all teams. Uh, of course, I already explained the Duray Division, Conestoga Division, as types of wagons. Another change that came to, and this came out of last year, where several teams requested this, and also the uh, mayors at the, uh, at the Scout cooking station. And I talked to Jeff about it, and we saw no reason not to do it. So starting this year, we will allow camp stoves to be used for the cooking problem, if the team wants to do it. It's an option. If your unit, you still want to cook on a fire, those fires will be available at the stations, so you can choose what you want to do. And it's totally up to you. There's no difference in the scoring whether you cook on a stove or on a fire, because it's totally based on the meal. So will they have to carry the stove? And yes. If you, want to, if you want to cook on a stove, you've got to bring your own stove. What do you get one in the camp stove? <laughs> I imagine a small portable stove. I'm not talking a big thing. And probably not talking a two or three burner Coleman still. Yeah, probably, probably. You know, I'm imagining a small backpacking stove type of thing. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes you know it may take a, it may take a little bit of shaking the tree this year to see how it works. You know, so. Whatever you bring, you must carry it in the sled. Yes, whatever you bring, you must carry it in the sled and. Somebody said something too, you know, if it's propane or whatever, fuel safety, that has to be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so they come in, normally they're cooking over this big fire that's already been prepared, they make this. Where are they, are they gonna have a separate place for stoves to set up? I'm still gonna work with Charlie on that. That hasn't been defined yet. Yeah, because there's a lot of, through NPAC, safety on all of that yeah. that has to be addressed differently. Mm -hmm. The other reason I ask is, some of these camp stoves, some of the kids have sit very low to the ground. And if there's snow, you know, yeah. what we'll, we'll, we'll still, area or, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll still be working out the logistics on this, but, uh, and if you have any questions, just feel free to contact me. I'll, I'll forward it up to Jeff as we have these discussions. Okay. Our team teams should be able to do both. If their stove doesn't work, they want yeah. them, they can cook on fire. Yeah. But I'm saying cooking fires will still be available for those teams wanting to use them. Yeah, sometimes when you're trapped on the trail, yeah. you don't have a stove with you. Well, well, as I said, this was a request that came from several teams plus the mayors at the scout station, uh, they, back in their notes. And I actually, I sent it up to Jeff right after the derby last year to start the discussion on it. So, so we'll see how it goes. You know, so, so one of the things I've seen in 40-some years is 
you know, th things that we did. If I if I went back and ran the Derby in '74, like it, like today, you wouldn't recognize it. There's that many changes over the years. You literally would not barely recognize the program. No. Okay. Um, the other one, meet criteria, I made a couple changes, again, based on suggestions. Um, on the scouts, this was asked for, and we talked about it, and we decided to go with it. We are, in, in some ways, allowing hot dogs to be used, but only if it's an ingredient within a larger meal, okay? We're not, we still do not want kids, scouts. Weeblos, yes. Scouts, no. Putting a hot dog on a stick, putting it over fire and sticking it in a bun. We don't want that. Okay, but if you're making a meal that you want to use hot dogs as part of the meal, we are allowing that as a uh, meat now. And the same thing with lunch meats. We don't want lunch meat sandwiches out there, but if you, like say, have something that you want to make, some type of a food, and it uses lunch meat as an ingredient, you can use that. Again, and, and both times they must be cooked as part of the ingredient. Okay? Um, Foil packs, of course, are allowable as long as they're made on site. Um, mountain pie makers, I was asked about this last year. I did add it in last year's program at the last minute when we did the actual book. But if you want to make meals, again, as long as it meets the criteria of what constitutes a meal, you're welcome to use a mountain pie maker. I can put it that way. Okay? But it does have to, it does have to meet the requirements of the meal itself. So under the, the truth level, would a grilled ham and cheese sandwich count as a cooked meat? Because it involves more than just simply cooking a hot dog, yes. Okay, so the meat doesn't have to be directly grilled, it could be within. Yeah. The idea of maybe like somebody wanted to do like some kind of a, like a, mac, and like a mac and cheese with hot dogs in it or a, uh, you know, crank and beans, things like that. Yeah, so we, so we kind of softened it a bit to allow it as an ingredient. The, the thought has always been that, you know, we, we've always considered, maybe I'm wrong on this today, but in the past, particularly many, many years ago, the cooking station doubled as a hot meal on the trail. It was not meant strictly as to simply a cooking exercise for score. The idea was you, sometime during the day, you got a good hot meal out on the trail because it's, you know, it's a wintertime event. Is that still how you, you know, the units that do it? Do you still consider it that? Yeah. Well, good. That, that, because that's what it's meant to be. A lot of the kids come out, they come ready to prepare a breakfast. Yeah. Some, they do sausage, eggs, the whole, I mean, it's, it's their hot meal on the trail. They right. They're closer to lunch. They may eat lunch stuff, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We blows, there was no real changes into the meat criteria because hot dogs were already allowed there as just a hot dog. Uh, the mountain pie makers are also allowed there as well. Okay, range station changes. Uh, for scouts, this constitutes the 22 rifle, archery, and tomahawk. There will be no skeet shoot again this year. Um, there's a couple reasons for this. I had initially looked at switching off Part of the problem right now is that there needs to be an earthen barrier wall between the skeet range and the rifle range because they're like a pair of pants and there needs to be a wall between them. They haven't built that wall yet. So by the regulations, they can only use one of the ranges at a time. That's why we didn't have skeet last year. So I thought, okay, this year, let's switch off and do skeet instead of rifle. Except I found out the council only has two working shotguns and two staff members that's certified in skeet shotgun. So I kind of cut it out. So until those issues can be solved, skeet will not be a part of the derby. There's not much I can do about it. Yeah. Um, and then the weed blows, this would be BB gun and archery. Uh, it was suggested to me to, we could, we could also add in the slingshot to this. Um, it just was a little too late for me to really consider that for this year. Uh, for the Weeblows units here, would you like me to do a switch off uh, for something next year, like maybe archery or a BB gun and do slingshot? Do you think that's something the kids might like? I mean, I can look at it for future years. Something to think about? Okay. okay. Um, 
because I, I because they only hit nine stations, I don't want to make three range stations. I want to keep it to two. So, would you rather me drop archery or BB gun if I put that in? Never drop BB gun. Never drop no, the, the kids the kids <laughs> with growth type. You offer BB gun at any activity, mm -hmm. and it's swamped all day long. They love BB gun. Okay. A lot of them like the archery too, but some of the smaller youth do struggle a bit with, with the compound. Okay. All right, then I'll look at switching it off with archery maybe for next year. Okay. But never BB. All right, uh, and this year it's in the books. It's so I, I did consolidate it down. Now at the stations, when they get there, <clears throat> they have to do a knowledge check. They'll get like four random questions out of this to see, to see what it is. See if they have read them and stuff like that, okay? And there is two pages. One side is the safety rules. The other side are the voice commands and or whistle commands for the one station at them to tell you what they are. And there will be a knowledge check. I was told that last year several units Went to the station, did the knowledge checks, and then left. Never did the shooting. And that's not what the Derby is about. So this year, if they want to get the points for the station, they must also shoot whatever it is in addition to doing the knowledge check. They hate to do that, that kind of stuff. But uh, that's but that's kind of a yeah. It's almost a cheat. I consider it a cheat. Yeah, I'm going to get 50 easy points and not worrying about the rest. That's not what it's all about, you know, the Derby. It's supposed to be, I always, my father and I before me, we always, always considered the Derby to be a fun outdoor winter event with the spice of competition. We never considered the Derby to be a strict competitive event, competition event. We wanted to be fun for the scouts, you know. And, and I, I, I see that kind of stuff, I, I kind of think of in the realm of cheating. So if you want to get the, teams want to get the points, with the knowledge check, they must also shoot. Otherwise, they get a zero for the station. Same thing at living history. They will come in, the parents will come in sometimes to me all the time and say, can we check in and go get something to eat? And I'll say, no, wait until the kids come and I'll check them in. Because then they'll say, well, we'll just stand outside and look through the window. Yeah. No, that's yeah. not what it's about. It's about coming yeah. in and listening to the mm -hmm. detail. But, um, and I may slip that in as a, as a general rule for, for all stations that they must fully participate in the station to get the points. So. I really like this rule that comes with common. There might be, especially at the Weebos level, there might be that one Weebos that has an aversion to shooting a gun. Okay, there are built into the into the Derby rules exceptions for those scenarios. Okay, yeah. we're not talking about that. Okay, like like say it's, it's already built in. If a, if a scout for some reason can't shoot or whatever, they are then not counted as part of it. Okay, that is a specific exception that's allowable. But it's simply, it, but it's not meant to be, well, we're just going to get the points for the rules and not worry about shooting and leave. That's what we're talking about here. All right, cool. Yeah. Okay. Stations. Dre, this, this is Weeblo's division, remember Dre? Okay, uh, and again, this is just to reiterate these. These are in the book. Cooking is... Pretty much the same, except for that change for allowing the camper stove. Um, these are within there. You know, they're also specified in this book. Uh, everything that's everything that's up here is in the book. Okay. Uh, these are just the cooking notes. Again, all of these notes are in the book. And highlight just a couple. You know, uh, cooking a meal on the camp stove. You know, cleaning up after yourself. Things like that. The meat criteria is also in here. And again, that was established to kind of make the kids know what they need to do for scoring. If you want to send a hoagie with them as a separate meal on the trail, you're more than welcome to. We're only talking about this kind of stuff as for scoring of the station. Okay. Portage, first responder, BB gun archery, pretty much standard as they have been before. Cargo Express, I'm going to describe that one in a couple minutes because the scouts also do that and it's a fun, different way of doing it. Uh, geography, again, um, this will be, I'll describe this for the scouts as well. And uh, matter of fact, I'll describe all four of these here in a moment when I describe the scouts because they're basically the same for both divisions. Okay. Uh, any questions on the gray division? Okay, Conestoga, cooking again. 
No changes here in the menu and stuff except for the allowable things that's off the meat criteria. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, these are the notes with it. Again, the additions I've already talked about are within it. This one here, I'll just point out the difference here in the planning in the cooking and the cost per scout. Yes. So, I don't know if any of your scouts actually ever do that stuff, even though they're supposed to. Most it's part of the scoring at the station. Know how much a state costs. Yeah, the Weeblers don't get that, but the scouts. This kind of, This was originally taken from the skill award, I think, mm -hmm. requirements, so that if the scouts didn't have the skill award, doing this would yeah. pass those off for them. There's some things that are built into this that do. Uh, I, I'm, I don't follow it close enough now to know what they are anymore, but we always tried to build some of the things in here that the, if the boys or the scouts didn't have those things, doing them at the derby, they could then get those things passed off. Okay, uh, same thing here, um, just those couple changes I already described. Uh, these stations, again, all the same. Uh, tomahawk throw, um, it might be at a different location this year. Um, there's, there's an issue with the safety zone around it, uh, so just be in the, that it might not be down at the Troop 4 cabin this year. We're still working that out with Charlie as to where we can set that up. Uh, okay, I'm gonna skip Carver Express a moment because I have a separate slide for that. Geography, this one, uh, there'll be a map and like label, like the, remember I said the Great Valley is known as the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia or whatever. So this will be a thing where they come in and they label the regional names of the Great Valley and some of the major towns that were along the Great Wagon Road. Uh, and if, if you just go in and Google Great Wagon Road, and select images out of that, you'll see all kinds of maps of, of the, uh, the Great Road from actual historic maps up to modern maps and such. So basically just be a, a simple geography station with, and, uh, and such where they have to label those. Uh, the theme, uh, like I've done in the past, they'll have different types of wagons and to identify which type of wagon is which and what it was used for. Uh, mystery campsite, pretty much before, you know, pick out mistakes in a model campsite. Uh, sled rescue, there's a, we've done this in the past where they have to rescue a sled that's fallen down a hill. You have to bring it up using ropes and proper knots and whatever. Living history, uh, Ray Owen always seems to be a good entertainer and he's coming back again this year. He's going to do a program based on the Teamsters. And the, the, the Teamster, today we think a Teamster is a labor union, you know, the truckers union. Back then, a Teamster was the occupational name of the people who drove teams. So, you'll kind of be doing for that. Okay. Cargo Express. <laughs> I thought about it this year. One of the great things about the wagon road was that a lot of these wagons transported commodities up and down the road for sale. And what I did was I decided to choose 10 of those. And here's the list. There's like iron, deer skins, lumber, dried, dried fish. I'm trying to read my things there. Textiles, grain, salt, coffee, tea, cocoa, spices, and rice. These are examples of commodities that were tr transported up and down the road. So instead of doing the strand of uncooked spaghetti and the grain of rice this year, each team will have to bring an example of this along with them on the sled. And what I did was I made them very small samples. For instance, for iron, it's anything made of iron or steel with a weight no greater than one pound. It doesn't have to weigh a pound, but anything under a pound. We don't want, I don't want somebody to bring pound a, you know, a 20 pound anvil, for instance, okay? So it's just something small, a pound or less, yes. So is that, like for iron, if they have a small axe on their sled, would they be able to cross count those things? Or yes. Yeah, any, all it says is as long as it's made of iron or steel. Okay. okay. So one of their, like, yeah, if that's something they would normally carry, yes. And um, like say another one is for, for lumber. It's just a small piece of wood, you know, no bigger than six inches by three inches by one inch. Could that be the half of the axe? The what? Could that be the half of the axe? It could be, as long as it's something of wood, okay? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and, and the idea is, you know, that because because the reason we're doing this is they're gonna they're gonna be part of the station. When they arrive at the other stations, what the, what the idea is, and I may still tweak this a little bit, 
when they come there, they'll basically say, I have stuff to sell. Would you like some iron? Okay. And then the mayor will have one card or three cards that they would like to be an index card, and maybe the team will choose it at random if they have three. All right. On the card will be three categories of commodities. If, so, they, so when they get to the station, they have to offer one commodity. They only, they only offer one. If the top one in line one is that commodity, they get 100 points for that. Okay, at their, or they get, get the points for that at their station. Okay? And if it's the second one, there'll be three commodities listed under category two. So they have a one in three chance of matching if they don't match the first one. The third level will be all the other commodities. So at the very least, they'll get 50% of the score by offering that particular commodity at that station. So if it's the top one, they get 100%. Second one, they get 75%. It's one of the three. The rest of them is 50%. I'm also working, we're looking at getting some gold coins that then they would be paid based on that. Like, for instance, at level one, they'll get three. Level two, they'll get two, and level one or level three, they'll get one. And these are, of course, cheap plastic coins. We're not going to be giving out real gold coins. Um, so, Paul, in that scenario, yeah. they're going to give that to the mayor at that station? No, they'll offer it. I mean, they'll keep it on the sled. Okay. Because it, it may be something that they, maybe they offer the same item at all the stations. So all they need to do is offer it, but then they will take it back with them. Yeah, they're not going to give it up there. So they're going to, so we're going to, at that point, then they'll just kind of like go back in. So they get the coins. Now, when they're done, they'll come back to the, uh, to the uh, dining hall there. Before they check back in, they'll go to the station, and then they'll get a score based on how many coins they got. And they'll turn all of their coins in. Because they're, remember, they're, they're transporting as, like, say, a trucker. All right? So he wouldn't keep, wouldn't keep that part of it. And then each one of the kids once they turn them in, we'll each be given one coin in payment for transporting through the day. Then they'll take that coin into the kitchen to get their free cup of cocoa. And then even if they want to, I don't care, they can keep it as a souvenir of the day. You know, if they don't want it, the kitchen staff will throw it in a bucket. Otherwise, keep it. Okay? So that's how that'll work this year. What do you think about that idea? I said I may still tweak it on scoring a bit, but that's basically how it's going to work. So just clarification. So yeah. those are the mayors of the stations that they're offering this to, right? Yes. The points that you described, that's not related to the... It's not related to the station they're at. There, right? What they'll do is there'll be, a, there'll be a score page in the book where they'll check off, you know, I said I still have to work out details, but they'll, they'll put it on that page, on the page for, that partic for the Cargo Express station, not on their station. Okay? So basically they'll get two scores at each station. Yeah. And I'm already suggesting to them to have one person dedicated to that, so they don't have, they're not scrambling around. So when I rec as I recruit the teams, when I'm going to suggest to them having one score person this year to specifically take care of just of that part. Okay. Well, yes. When, it, when you reach clarity on how this is going to work, are we all going to find that out beforehand? Uh, it depends on what it is. It might just be how to exactly score it within the program. But, but essentially, I gave you how this is going to work. Which one you offer and what you get is the thing that sounds confusing to me. It, it, well, it's kind of like, I, I was trying to think of its way. It's a, it has a bit of, of randomness to it. Okay? So you have 12 items. Okay? And as I said, if you get to the station, the, they'll have a, they'll, the, mayor's will, the mayor will have a card or a paper or something like that that has three categories on. Category one is what we need. Category two, we do need this, but it's not high priority. The rest of them is okay, we'll take it, basically. All right? So they're coming along. They offer one of these items for sale by present. They have to present it to the mayor. They have to show the commodity to them. So again, let's say, let's, let's pick it up. Let's say salt. They got a little bottle of salt. Say, so walk up here. How would you like to buy some salt off of me? Right? So the mayor says, okay, here's the chart. He looks at it. If the number one top item is salt, the team gets 100% of the points for that particular station. 100% of the cargo points. Well, it'll be, I said, I still have to work out how to point point this because 
this, you know, the total station is going to be worth 100 points, but they'll say they'll get, they'll get like, like 100 points or whatever the point is, there would be 100% of, of the points for that particular station, however I work out the number of points. Right. Like say, say it's 10 points. Right. Okay. Yeah. So in that scenario, they would get the full 10 points at that station. And then whatever the station is, they get the points. Well, then the station is, the station problem is a separate thing. Okay. That's not, the, this, that 10 points is not included in the station problem. Okay. That 10 points would be recorded on the cargo station score sheet. So maybe differentiate between cargo points and steel points. Right. And I said, I'll still have, I have to work that out to make sure that it's easy for the mayors. Yeah, so the cargo applies to every, all the stations. Right. So applies to all the stations. Uh, yeah. That's why I suggested having someone just dedicated to that. That's what I'm going to suggest. Okay, now, if it's on the second line, there'll be three, like say, for instance, there'll be deer skins, textiles, and tea as the three commodities on line two. If what they offer is one of those three, then they would get 75% of the points, or like seven, maybe like seven or eight points for choosing on the second line. Okay. If, it's, if they did not, that, that's four out of 12 chances to get either 10 points or like say seven points, eight points, or whatever. If they don't get it, they'll get five points for offering it because line three will be all the other items. So in no case, if they present an item, will they get zero points? The only way to get zero points is if they don't offer it. But they gotta offer. They you have to offer. You don't have to ask. You don't ask them, they have to offer. Okay. So each station will have a different one, two, three. Yes. Okay. And uh, it, they are the team is only allowed to offer one thing one, one time. One thing, one time at the station. Yes. And I may do it too, where the mayors may have three cards that are all different to randomize it a bit more. So it is at a point with well, if you go there, it's salt. You know what I mean? So you know, I might do that. You might need ten cards. Yeah. Because they will. They, They'll, they'll be crafty and they'll yeah. figure it out and they'll tell the bodies. <laughs> to me, that would be counterproductive know, because they would tell our teams how to get more points. Yeah, yeah. You know, but it's happened in the past. But I may do that where the, and then the team will select one card at random, you know, for, for the particular scoring of that. Is it, you know, is it, it's still got to work out all the bugs to it beforehand, but I think it'll be fun to do. Yes. So each team has to have all 12 items? Yes. Will they have to turn off all of at some point? No. So that one team can take one item and turn it every time and get points. Yeah, but, but they take the items back. They don't actually give them, they only offer them. I know. As far as that, but once, once that particular scoring is done, then they get that item back because they may want to offer it at another station. So, so when they get to the last question, station. The question is, who's going to check the inventory to make sure you have all 12? What I think is more specific to this Salt carry salt well, salt that will be part of it, you know, when, when they, Cargo Express, when they go out, they'll have to show all 12 items initially, okay? And then at the end, they'll have to show all 12 items that they still have them. Okay? So it'll be a check on a Cargo Express in yeah. the beginning and at the check, end. And a check out. Yes. So, but that, that's essentially how I figured this is going to work. Hopefully, hopefully it'll work well. Sometimes an idea looks great up on the screen or on, on the book. I, I've had a few of those over the years where it seemed to be good, you know, in the planning process. It just absolutely did not work out in the field. So, so, so anyway, any questions on the Derby itself? Okay, well, hope you come. <laughs> <laughs>